Mr. Nicholas, thanks so much for being here. I know this is a uh, holiday. You've got a big family. Thanks for taking the time, you and Barbara, to be here with us. We appreciate it very much. Pleasure. Thank you. So I have a story where you and I met quite a while ago. I was playing Frenchman's Creek. I was an assistant golf professional at Innisbrook Resort. My buddy and I had, had played. We were in the halfway house eating lunch. And there you were with your sons. And my buddy, who's an autograph hound, wanted to jump up and get your autograph. And I said, calm down. He's with his family. You know, he doesn't get that much time. Let him be, and maybe we'll catch him on the way out. So we caught you on the way out and tried to come up with a creative way to get an autograph from you. And so we handed you the card. It's not that hard, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> we handed you the card and said, Mr. Nicholas, would you please attest our scorecard? <laughs> you grabbed the card, looked at the card, looked back at us, looked at the card, and you said, how do I know you boys shot these scores? <laughs> and then signed your name. So we appreciated that very much. Did you, did you shoot those scores? 70 and 71. Really? Yes, sir. Wow. <laughs> I do also want to thank, in addition to Barbara, I want to thank and recognize uh, Jack's partner and chairman of the Nicholas Companies, Howard uh, Milstein, who is also publisher of Golf Magazine and a big supporter of Junior Golf, uh, as well as a close friend of Rolex. So we got that one out of the way. Thanks, Howard. Do you mind if I call you Jack? I hope so. OK, thank you, sir. Hope you will. Uh, makes me a little uncomfortable doing that, but we're going to give it a shot. Uh, first question is kind of an intro and a question, so bear with me. Jack, you're a father of five, 22 grandchildren. You played at the highest level of professional golf since the 1960s. Successful businessmen, built a global brand, member of the World Golf Hall of Fame, captains of Ryder Cup and President Cup, author of several golf books. Philanthroper, you've raised hundreds of millions of dollars for children's health care. Golf course designer, there went my mic. Golf course designer, host of your own PGA Tour event. You've won every award known to man. How did you balance your career with your family? <laughs> well, I had, I had a great wife. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Barbara? Barbara, where are you? I can't see out there. Where is she? Stand up, Barbara. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, I think family is the key to to anything, and that uh, I was I, I married met, I met Barbara. We've been married 59 years. We met our first week in college. Uh, we got married after our third year in college. We were both 20 years old. You all look at that today and say, oh. <laughs> and uh, we, had, uh, we had our first child uh, a year and a half later. And we had, uh, so we had five. We had four boys and a girl. Uh, they all, uh, uh, all are good kids. They all, they all, Actually, all five of our kids went to college on a D1 scholarship. We had Jackie went to North Carolina and played golf, and Steve went to Florida State and played football. Nan went to Georgia and played volleyball. Gary went to Ohio State and played golf, and Michael went to Georgia Tech and played golf. And, uh, you know, we were, we were blessed with that, but the thing is that I had, uh, uh, I, I, was, I was playing golf, and that's where Barbara came in to, she raised the kids, made sure that the kids, if the kids needed discipline, she did them. She didn't want dad to come home and have to discipline the kids because, you know, they wanted them to be my friend, not have dad be a bad guy. And so, and Barbara understood that I didn't need confrontation, I needed support. So those are all the things that, that make for a great wife and make for a great relationship. And uh, I thank her again, Barbara, thank you.
And so, you know, now we, you know, we, we, I don't play much golf anymore. I play golf, I sort of play golf when I have to. And that's not very often, fortunately, because it's sort of a, it's, it's not very pretty anymore. But uh, I, do, I do enjoy it when I do play, because generally speaking, it's gonna, I'm involved with a charity event of some kind, or we're involved in some, with some, some a bunch of guys my age that can play about, like, about, about as, bad as badly as I do. And, uh, but, uh, I'm sorry? Somebody said something, but that's all right. Uh, the, uh, but I love the game. The game uh, opened the doors for everything that we did. Uh, I think my father taught me uh, you know, sportsmanship, discipline, patience, uh, a lot of things that I think you need to have if you want to be successful. And uh, it's uh, fairness. Fairness is an important part. I think it's really so important. Uh, whatever, uh, you always try to treat your fellow competitor fairly. I think it's, uh, I'm sure you want to beat them, but you also got to treat them fairly because they, you know, it's, it's the right way to do it. But anyway, uh, I don't remember which question was, Steve. But <laughs> that's an answer to four or five of them. We'll take whichever I one you, you want. I think you did a great job with that. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack, we're seeing young professionals, uh, both men and women, LPGA and PGA Tour, in their 20s, uh, following in your footsteps to create foundations and giving back to their communities and charities of their choice. You must be proud of what you're seeing with this young group of professionals. What influenced you to begin helping others? Well, I, I go back and uh, the tour, the, the, when we were playing, the tour was not real big on charity. We had charity, uh, but the charities weren't, weren't the, the guiding focus of the tour. Uh, every tournament gave so much money to charity, and we didn't think, didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it until we started seeing what, 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 it, was, what it was really doing. And as the tour has started to go, and I'm sure, I don't know whether you kids realize it, but the PGA Tour and, and golf itself raises more money uh, for charity than all the other sports combined each year. That's pretty good. And the, uh, uh, the, the kids today that are coming out on the tour, the, the uh, Jordan Spees, Ricky Fowlers, the George, Justin Thomases, uh, the young kids that are coming on tour are all now, they, they realize and see what good uh, that the charities are doing, and they're not, they're not raising just a couple of dollars, they're raising millions of dollars, and they're raising millions of dollars every year, and it's really, it's really quite, kind of nice. So I know that, Barb, we have several events that, that raises money for our foundation, and usually when one gets started, I, there's usually, they call Barb before we ask them to play, they say, I, I smell there's a, here there's a new event coming along, count me in, which is kind of neat. Uh, you know, it's, it's really neat that the, kid, the, the kids out there really want to be part of it and participate. And we're, uh, we're, we're, we're so thankful that they are. Uh, the kids today, we say get it. They understand yeah. it. They understand what the tour does. And they understand the good that it does. And so they, uh, they participate. Well, you and Barbara have been great hosts to our Leadership Links uh, juniors who raise money for uh, your health care children's health care and we really appreciate you bringing those young men and women into your home, showing them your home, having breakfast with them. You're, what an inspiration it is for these young men and women to be in your home and uh, be a part of, of giving to their favorite charity. So, well, we enjoy having them. Thank you very much. It's really much. kind of neat every year to see these young kids that come, come and uh, have, have worked in their area to uh, raise money for our foundation. and. Uh, it'll, it'll pay them dividends in the future, no question about it. Absolutely. I know we want to get up uh, Rose Zhang and uh, Maxwell Moldovan to uh, ask Mr. Nicholas some questions. So could they come up at this time? And uh -oh, here we okay. go. Rose and Maxwell. Let Rose go first here, Rex. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Nicholas. 
I love to ask a few questions about the 1986 Masters. Uh, it was a little before my time, but on behalf of those... Uh, <laughs> a little before mine too, Rose, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of others who may not know, I've heard that year was pretty tough for you. Pretty what? Tough for you. No, nah, it was great for me. I, I, I won. Uh, the 86 Masters was a, a year that, for those of you who don't know, I basically uh, won 17 of my majors uh, by 1980, which was my, I was 40 years old. And I still love to play the game. I didn't play a lot. I was playing 11 or 12 tournaments a year. Uh, in the, in the, when I was in my 40s, 1986 rolled around. And I'd won, I'd won just two tournaments. I won one in 82. Uh, the Colonial and I won the Memorial in 84. And so the Masters rolled around and I prepared for it reasonably, not as much as I normally would. But uh, I found a, a putter that, week, that year, that, the big old putter. I don't you know if you probably <laughs> never even seen one. It was about that long. It was the ugliest thing you've ever wanted to see, but, but it rolled the ball really nicely. And so I. I found myself putting a little bit better when I got to Augusta, and I didn't start all that great, but uh, I got better every day. And then I got to the last round, and I was four shots out of the lead, and I only had eight players in front of me. And, I, and my son Steve called me that Sunday morning, and he said, what do you think, Pops? And I said, well, Steve, I, said, I think 66 will tie, 65 will win. He says, exact number I got in mind, go shoot it. So I got out and I sort of disappointed the front nine. I was even par through eight and I ended up about 12 feet at nine and I was getting ready to hit my, uh, my putt and there was a big roar went up at the eighth green. And there was a hole behind us. The Seve Ballesteros was there and he had just hold a wedge shot for an eagle. And before I could putt, another big roar went up for the eighth green. It was Tom Kite. He hold a wedge shot for an eagle right on top of him. Now these are the guys I'm trying to beat. <laughs> and, and so I looked, and I'd been sort of nervous because I hadn't been able to get anything in the hole. I said, I looked at the people around there and says, you know, they made a lot of noise down there. Let's see if we can make some noise here. And I knocked the putt in. The crowd went wild. I birdied 11, I birdied, birdied 10, birdied 11. I made, stubbed my toe a little bit at 12, made a bogey. But then I birdied 13, part 14. And I hit, set out in the middle of the fairway at 15. And I knew I was still behind. And I said to my son, Jack, who was caddying for me, I said, how far do you think three will go here? And I said, I don't mean iron. And he said, I think it'll go a long way, Dad. So I had a four iron shot. I had, you guys will, short clubs for you today, but I was 214 yards, and I hit a four iron, and I hit it in about, oh, I don't know, 12 feet, I guess, and I made the putt. And uh, so that put me, and I knew I was still behind, even because Seve Ballesteros had just eagled uh, 13. And I went to 16 and I hit it, it almost made a hole in one. I hit, a, I hit my shot, I hit a five iron, and there was going to the hole and, I, and my son Jack says, be good. And I says, it is. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the cockiest remark I've ever made. <laughs> I will promise you. Never made a comment like <clears throat> that before. I didn't even look at it because I knew it was, I knew it was going to be really close. I just barely missed going in for a hole in one. I made the putt. Went to 17, and I was on 17 T, and a strange thing happened. There was sort of a groan and a roar at, se at, se at 15. Biasteris had hit a second shot in the water. I knew exactly what it was, because you, know, you, you hate that sound for somebody making a mistake, but, you, but you, you knew that some people were cheering, and I don't like cheers for bad shots, and because uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the sportsmanship way to do it. But anyway, I knew what had happened. So anyway, I, birdied, I, I made about a 12-footer for birdie at 17, and for the first time I was in the lead in the tournament. I parred the last hole and ended up winning. So that was a pretty exciting week for me. <laughs> what, what was neat about the week was my son Jack, it's the first time he'd been on the bag at Augusta. My mother and my sister, it's the first, they came back for the first time since 1959. That was the first year I played. And they hadn't been back for 27 years to watch me play at the Masters. And for some reason, they decided to go back in 86. Mm -hmm. It's kind of neat. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I played in the first Augusta National Women's Amateur this year. Did you play last year, huh? This year. You did play. Well, this year, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, what impact do you think the event will have on golf uh, into the future? Well, I, what I liked about it is that, that uh, Augusta included the girls in, in the game. And they made a statement that, uh, you know, we're not just about males playing the Masters. We're about trying to bring, to bring everybody together and ever to grow the game. So I thought that was a really nice thing that they did. Uh, the tournament was a good tournament. Um, the gal at one finished pretty well, didn't she? She went buried five of the last six. Yeah. And so that's pretty strong at Augusta National. I don't care if you're playing what tees you're playing from. You, and I know they didn't play the forward tees. They played because they didn't have any forward tees. And so they, 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 they did very well. But I thought it was great for the game. I thought it was, it was, it was, uh, it was something great for women's golf. And uh, I'm sure that they're going to have it again this year. I, I, I would this next year, I'm sure. And it's uh, it just it just makes it, it just makes a nice statement. Thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Nicholas. I'm thrilled to be sitting up here with you tonight. Not just because you're one of the best to ever play the game, but because you and I share a, a common thing: loving the scarlet and gray. So I'm wondering, what is your favorite memory as a Buckeye? Well, let's see, which football game? I guess. <laughs> uh, well, my dad went to Ohio State, Maxwell, and he played football, basketball, and baseball at Ohio State. And uh, uh, he introduced me to all sports, and I, and I, I decided it didn't make any difference to me. I, obviously, I was recruited by a lot of schools, and I told him not to bother. I was going to Ohio State, period. I just wanted to go to Ohio State. Grew up in, grew up in Columbus. Met Barbara my first week in college at Ohio State. Uh, we, uh, uh, I love playing, and I love playing golf at Ohio State. Freshmen couldn't play in those days, and uh, the uh, as a sophomore, I made the Walker Cup team, and so I was a little, I was afraid to go in and see my golf coach because he, I didn't know what he was going to say, and I walked in and he said. He called me Nick. He said, Nick, congratulations. Boy, are you going to have a great spring. And I says, what do you mean, coach? And he says, he says, well, you're, he says, he says, you're not coming, going to school. He says, you're going to go play golf. I said, what are you talking about? I said, this is, this, is, this is my first year playing college golf. Not this year, you're not. You're going to go. He, he, he didn't want me to play, play college golf. He wanted me to go play. I played the Masters. I played the North-South. I played uh, the, uh, the British Amateur. I played uh, the Walker Cup matches. And he said, you can, play golf, you can play golf for Ohio State next year. That's, not many golf coaches would do that today. He was a, Bob Kepler was his name. He was a great guy. And uh, so I played there. So I went and did that. Then my junior year, uh, I, played, I played. And didn't, didn't do that great. I, didn't, I went, uh, let's see what I did. I lost the Big Ten by a shot and, and ended up uh, uh, Losing in the second round, I think we were playing match play then in the NCAA, and a third, second or third round, I don't remember which. But anyway, my senior year, I came back, and I, I don't, I don't. This is a little bit, little bit on the cocky side, but I got to tell you the story because I get a big kick out of because we didn't have a very good golf team at <laughs> Ohio State, and so we got to the Big Ten Championships, and it was, uh, and they were in Indiana, and. Kep came to me and he says, Nick, he says, I've never asked you to do anything since you've been in college. He says, but only one team from the Big Ten goes to the NCAA, and it's like, I, I need you to spread eagle the field. And I said, what do you mean by spread eagle the field, coach? He said, I need you to win the Big Ten by as many strokes as you can win, otherwise we're never going to get this team to the, to the NCAA. <laughs> okay. So said, well, I'll do my best. Why well, anyway, this is my cocky part, but I don't, I, I don't, mean, I don't mean it that way. I just mean it because it's a story. Anyway, I won the Big Ten by 23 shots. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> we won the team by one. <laughs> okay. Now we, now we went to the NCAA. At, there was at Purdue that year, and in those days, the NCAA, 36 holes was a qualifying for match play. And low 64 went to match play. 
and the uh, the team championship was decided by the 36 holes of metal play. Totally different today. And so I was medalist, and our second man was second medalist. And they took the best four out of five scores. And we ended up tying Houston, who was a defending uh, um, NCAA champion. Uh, we tied Houston for seventh place. We had we had uh, Houston was had the defending individual champion was a fellow named Dick Crawford, and he had been two-time NCAA champion. He misqualified for match play. Uh, Joel Goldstrand had two, two had an extra club in his bag. In those days, they penalized two two strokes a hole, so he, he got 36 hole penalty or 36 shot penalty. <laughs> and and Ron Weber played, and Ron had a 13 on the last hole. That's who we tied. <laughs> Seventh place. So anyway, we, I, you know, Ohio State wasn't a great team, but we had a great experience. I loved Ohio State. I loved, I loved the, uh, the camaraderie. I loved my, my teammates. I uh, had, uh, I, and I had a lot of teammates because we, we kept trying, trying to fill the three, four, and five spot a lot. And, uh, but uh, it's a great school. It's a, and no matter what school you go, if your college experience will be great for all you kids, you'll, you'll love it. Um, your passion for ice cream is well documented. P passion for what? Ice cream. <laughs> it, it was, yeah. <laughs> how, how did the, the milkshake tradition at the Memorial Tournament start? Uh, not sure how it started, but uh, probably started with my boys. Good gracious, Jack and Steve and Gary. You know, they love milkshakes, so they started making milkshakes. They, other people saw them making milkshakes, and they, they just start, they just made them. We saw, we had last year, I think the Memorial Tournament, we had made a little over 1,300 milkshakes for the week. <laughs> <laughs> the players love them. You good? Yeah. Okay, thank you all. I know we're gonna get some questions from the audience, so thank you. Max, Max, you got Rose, you thank you very there? much. Yeah, Good I got, job. I got another Max has another oh, one. Oh, he's got another one. Hold Max. on. Uh, nearly 40 professional golfers support AJGA tournaments in their names, and you support us with leadership links. As a player who aspires to have a successful enough career to warrant my own AJGA event someday, what does it mean to you to be able to give back with the Memorial Tournament? Well, the Memorial Tournament, it's a good question, Maxwell. The, uh, uh, when I was at the 1966 Masters, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who flew down with his wife and two friends and that crashed their airplane on the way down, got killed. And I, that week we, we sort of sat back and, and reminisced. I didn't want to play in the golf tournament. I did because you know, the guy was one of my closest friends. And they convinced me that he would wanted me to play. Anyway, so I played. And, but we also talked about the Memorial Tournament, or tar, tar, talk, talking about having, what, what, how, what a great place Augusta was and that, to bring that back to Columbus, to our hometown. And so we started working on it. And we started looking at property, and start buying property later on that year. And finally in 1972, we started construction of the golf course and finished it in 73. And uh, I worked with, the, worked with the PGA Tour, Joe Dye was then the commissioner, and he came out, we walked through the mud, and he came up with the idea of the memorial term of memorializing players of the past. And um, we had to pay our dues, we ended up having a tournament in Cincinnati for a couple years before we got the date we wanted to move to Columbus. And so the memorial tournament, actually the first year of the tournament was 1976. And it was, it was a dream for me to bring back golf to Columbus, Ohio, to Central Ohio, to give back what I felt that the people of Central Ohio had supported me and given to me throughout my career. And so that was how the Memorial Tournament started. And as far as, from my standpoint, I structured the tournament, structured the club, structured everything so I couldn't make a dime. I said, you know, I didn't want my fellow professionals coming into Muirfield and uh, saying, well, look, Jack's profiting off of us. I didn't want any of that, so I've never 
they're never profited off the memorial tournament. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the deal was that uh, uh, the players loved it. They always, they always say that it's their favorite tournament to come to. They're, they're treated better there. Uh, Central Ohio has supported the tournament <coughs> fantastically. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of worldwide recognition from it. Players come from all over the world. And for me, to have the tournament, it's a memorial tournament, it's not the Jack Nicklaus tournament. And I didn't want it to be a Jack Nicklaus tournament. Uh, I felt like it's, uh, it's been very rewarding for me and as, as a person and as a, a way that uh, uh, everybody's accepted what we've done. So it, it's something pretty special, actually, and to be able to uh, give back in a way that, the, and to uh, uh, the, the uh, Columbus Children's Hospital, now Nationwide Children's Hospital, has been the recipient of the proceeds from that tournament since day one. And the reason for that was in 1966, our daughter Nan was just about 11 months old and she kept choking. And uh, we never could figure out what it was. The doctor said, you need to take this young lady to the hospital. She's only 11 months old. And she found, we found a shadow in her lungs or in her windpipe. Turned out that she had inhaled a crayon they went down, tried to get the crane, dropped her lung. She went to pneumonia. She was in intensive care and oxygen tent for about six days. And as Barbara and I were sitting out uh, waiting in the waiting room, we just we, we said that if we ever have the opportunity or ever in a position to help others, we wanted to be children. And so uh, Dan obviously obviously made it. She's had five kids, and uh, uh, we. Uh, one of them, we saw catch four passes yesterday, even though they didn't win playing for Jacksonville, and they got beat by the Titans yesterday, but that was kind of nice to see him catch four passes. And uh, the, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I forgot what I was gonna say, <laughs> but the, uh, the so mortal benefit has benefited that hospital since day one. We've raised a lot of money for, for the hospital and uh, uh, you know, the Honda tournament we just played here benefits our foundation. Uh, we're very proud that we've, uh, we, since we started the foundation, the only golf tournaments so we're, have been donating to us, the little events we've had. We've raised a little over $100 million now in the last 15 years of our foundation. So we're very excited about that. And uh, we're now just sort of, we're just sort of, we feel like the tip of the iceberg. We're now gonna, we'll be able to grow greatly from here. and. Uh, it's, uh, it's neat to be able to have, be behind that and, and be part of it. Awesome. Thank you all, thank you both. And we've got, uh, we're gonna try to get some questions from the audience. Anybody? Yeah. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Here Mr. we go. Nicholas, um, what would you do differently in your career if you were to start over? Oh, well, I wouldn't lose all those tournaments. <laughs> uh, if I were going to start over, I don't know. I, I, I think that I was, I, was, I was very, very fortunate in that uh, I played all sports. And I, did, I didn't have a what if, meaning what if I, what if I had, uh, you know, kept with baseball? What if I'd have kept with football? What if I'd have stayed with basketball? I tried all those sports. Uh, I played them all reasonably well, but golf just seemed to fit me better than any other sport. And I could do golf. I go, I go early in the morning. I go stay till late at night. And whatever, whatever success I had was from the effort that I put into it. And I didn't have need, need anybody else other than my own effort to work at it. So that's what I loved about the game of golf. Uh, the work that you put into it, you're rewarded for how much, how much you really work at it. And so, uh, uh, what, have I done? what would I have done differently? Well, I, I, I had that part, so that was good. Then when I started playing golf, uh, I was fortunate that I didn't win everything right off the bat. Uh, the best thing that ever happened to me when I was 20 years old, uh, I shot 39 the last nine holes at the U.S. Open. Uh, 
and lost by, lost by two shots to Arnold Palmer, in case you forgot his name. <laughs> uh, but I lost to Arnold, and uh, uh, if I had won that tournament at age 20, I think I've been scratching my ears out here like this, <laughs> and I don't think I would have ever worked hard to get where I got. But, I, but I le you learn from that. You learn from your mistakes. You learn from your losses. And, and you learn to go forward. So I, I was pretty balanced because I got beat a lot. Everybody gets beat a lot in the game of golf. And you, you have to learn from that. And, and, you know, would I have changed anything? I don't know. I suppose if I would known a young man named Tiger Woods was coming along, I'd have probably played a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be about 40. Tried to, tried to up that 18 majors a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it so happens that my, my goal was to break Bobby Jones's record, which was 13. I did that in 1973. And then I didn't really have any big goals beyond that. And so I kept playing because I enjoyed the game, but I ended up winning five more. Uh, but if I'd known he was coming, I would have worked harder. <laughs> I mean, you need something to push you. You need somewhere to go. And I, but, I was, but I was also at a stage of my life uh, in the 40s where my kids were playing high school sports. And I would, I would probably just really have been with them than to do something myself. And uh, I spent a lot of time watching them, being with them, watching them grow, uh, which was far more important to them than to what I did. And uh, so. I don't think I would change anything. I think I was a, I was a pretty, pretty blessed person to be able to uh, have things fall into, into place pretty well. And, uh, you know, that's, that's I, I, I don't have any what ifs. Very good. That's, that's a great way to be. <laughs> Other questions? Here we go. Uh, Mr. Nicholas, did you ever feel intimidated by other golfers like Arnold Palmer, Gary Player, like all those big names? And if you did, how did you manage that? How did you overcome it? What were those names again? I don't think I've ever heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I never really did. Uh, <clears throat> I always felt like, you know, I, I tell you my stories about Arnold because I think you might, might enjoy that. Uh, I first. I first saw Arnold Paul. Arnold was 10 years older than I. And Arnold, uh, we were, I was playing the Ohio State Amateur in, in Toledo, Ohio, Sylvania, and I was 14 years old. And I, I, it was a rainy day on a Tuesday, and it was just pouring down rain. And I was the only person on the golf course. And I came off the golf course just drenched. And there was one person on the practice tee. And I saw this guy at the practice team. He looked like a very strong guy, just bashing these nine irons about 10 feet high. And I, I, I watched him for about 20 minutes there in the rain. I said, man, is that guy strong? And I went to the locker room. I said, who is that fellow in the rain? I said, well, that's our defending champion, Arnold Palmer. So that's the first time I saw Arnold. And I don't remember, what was your question? Oh, yeah, the guy's intimidated. So anyway, I got to be. I got to be 18 years old before I met Arnold. I didn't meet him at that tournament. And I was playing in, in Athens, Ohio. Dal Finsterwald had won the PGA the year before, and they were having a celebration day for Dal. And Arnold was invited. I was invited. Dal said, I was an 18-year-old kid and another fella. And, we, and on the first tee, we had a little clinic. And at the end of the clinic, we had a driving contest. And the first hole was about 300, a little over 300 yards. Arnold drove it on the green. And I drove it about 40 yards over the green. <laughs> and I never let Arnold forget that. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but I shot 63 and you shot 67. So that was the start of our rivalry. <laughs> and we competed in everything. And we loved competing against each other. We loved beating each other's brains out. And yet when we get done with, get done with the round, Winnie, Arnold's wife, was Barbara's best friend. We'd go to dinner, we'd do lots of kinds of things afterwards. We played we play bridge, which I don't know anybody plays bridge anymore. But anyway, we played that all the way across the Atlantic, going to the British Open, all that kind of stuff. 
And so Arnold was, Arnold was a great friend, and he was a great mentor to me. He took me under his wing. Didn't have to when I turned on the earth, but he did. And I'll never forget playing with Arnold in 1962, my first, my first year on tour. We're playing in Phoenix, and Arnold was going to win the golf tournament. He was well ahead, and we're playing together in the last round. And we walked off the 17th green, he put his arm on my shoulder, and he, he, Arnold was 32 and I was 22, and he said, he said, okay, he says, now, you, you can finish second here. He said, you just got this par five, he says, play it smart, you can birdie the hole, and you know, just keep your composure. Because I had, I played five tournaments and I hadn't been better than about 15th. And so, I, I did, I birdied the hole, finished second. Arnold, Arnold won my 12 shots, so it really didn't make any difference about, from that standpoint. So, but anyway, I thought that was really nice that he took me under his wing. And I think you got you to do that with your fellow competitor a lot. You'll see the young guys come along, you see a lot of the older guys help them along. I think that's really neat. And that's why I, try, I got so many of the young guys that come to me today, and I love it, basically because of what Arnold taught me. You know, take, take care of, your, of the guys, help them along. Life is not easy, easy on a tour. And, it's, uh, and the help you get is, is, is very much appreciated. So anyway, Arnold and I played a lot of competitive rounds against each other. Gary Player, Gary's probably, Gary's got six kids and 22 grandkids, so they're very similar to our family. So Gary's probably become my closest friend just because of family. And here's a guy that's 84 years old, and I want to tell you one thing, he can still really play. He plays very well. And, uh, but as far as intimidation, <coughs> I never worried about intimidation because uh, I felt like the only person I could control was me. And uh, I couldn't control Arnold, I couldn't control Gary, I couldn't control whoever else played well. And so uh, I really worked and concentrated on what I did, not some, what somebody else did. I enjoyed playing with Arnold, I enjoyed playing with Gary. I enjoyed playing with Joe Jones, who, you know, nobody knew. I enjoyed playing with whomever I played with, because I think they were, they all, they all got themselves in that position by playing well. So you respect them for being in that position, and, and, and you know, go enjoy your round of golf with them. Thank you, Jack. Another question? Yeah. The young lady over here. Here we go. Um, what was the most difficult moment in your golf career and how did you get through it? My most difficult moment in golf? Well, let's see. I think my, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that question, really. Uh, let's see. I think I'll start off in a little different way. Uh, when our first son uh, was, Barbara was pregnant for our first child. I was still an amateur, and I was playing in a golf tournament in Cincinnati with my golf coach, Bob Kepler. And we were playing, we, were, we had won it the year before, it was called the U.S. Pro-Am. And we won it the year before, we were going, getting ready to go down to Cincinnati, and, and uh, uh, Barbara was close to expecting uh, and delivering, and I said, uh, are you all right? She says, oh, I'm fine. So, uh, so anyway, so I went down to the tournament. It's only 100 miles away. And uh, that night I called her and she was fine. Not, not a word. We played at 1 o'clock the next day. At 8 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. And it's Barbara. I said, Barbara, what, you, know, you know I don't play this afternoon. So I just wanted to call you and tell you you're a dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So... So that's how I found out my first one was foul child was born. And we got through the round of golf. And so I drove back that, that afternoon after we played, went back to the, to the hospital, and I went up to, the, to where they had the babies. I said, which one's mine? They said, that one there is yours. And I keeled over straight backwards onto a terrazzo floor. I faded with all my kids mm. the first time I saw them. And so anyway, that was a difficult <laughs> time for me in golf. <laughs> we went back the next day and won the tournament. <laughs> but uh, as it relates to playing golf, uh, 
I suppose, let's see. I don't really know. I, don't, I mean, I had a lot of times when I lost. I suppose that the, the two times that were probably the most difficult for me was something that, that I didn't do. 1972, I won the first two legs of the Grand Slam. I won the Masters in the US Open. And we were at Muirfield, Scotland. And I went to the 18th hole and uh, on the last round, and Trevino had hit his third shot over the green on par 5, 17th, and he was ticked off, and he went up and hit a very quick chip shot that went down, bounced out of the rough rim, now went into the hole. And he beat me by a shot. So that was number one that it was hard to take because I, I would have I would have won I lost by one shot so I would have won the first three majors at the same time and I would have held all four of them because I had the PGA but I still held the PGA and then in uh, in '82 uh, Watson had a uh, on, 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 I was on the 18th green and I was being interviewed by Jack Whitaker from ABC at the time and he said Jack it's a pleasure to be a in, in your time, you're winning the fifth, your fifth U.S. Open. And all of a sudden, there was a big yell coming up from the 17th green, and I watched Salt Watson running around the green. <laughs> well, he had chipped it in on an impossible chip, but he played, it, but he played a great shot, as did Trevino. And so, uh, how did I handle those? Hey, <clears throat> they, they performed the shots. And you have to perform shots to win. I performed a couple to win for myself. And so, uh, you know, all I do is stick out my hand and say, congratulations, well done. And that's all you can do. And, uh, you know, uh, it would have been nice to win those, but they did better than I did, so it was well done. Another question? Here we go. Mr. Nicholas, the AJGA didn't exist when you were growing start, start up. Start over, I didn't miss you. The, the hey. AJGA didn't exist when you were growing up. How did you navigate your path as a junior golfer? We didn't, we didn't have junior golf when I grew up. Um, we had, uh, I started on a, uh, on a Friday, like a lot of kids. I was 10 years old in a junior class with 60 kids. And uh, the, uh, after about two or three weeks of a Friday class, Jack Grout was a, my teacher, the fellow was there. He would bring me out of the, out of the uh, crew. He says, Jackie boy, he says, come out here, show these kids how to hit a high shot. Show these kids how to hit a slice. Show these kids how to hit a hook. And he sort of instilled in me sort of, uh, the, uh, made me feel good about what I was doing and how I could be the example. <clears throat> so anyway, that sort of got interested. Now, uh, my, I'll never forget that summer, that was in June and July, my dad got the bill from Scioto for, the, in those days they had little buckets of range balls, and they were 35 cents a bucket, about 50 balls in a bucket. And he had a bill in July for, I think, $370 for, <laughs> for balls. And he said, Jack, what do you do? I said, Dad, you told me you wanted me to learn how to play golf. And I says, he said, okay. He never said another word. And so anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, pretty soon Jack Grout really saw something in this young kid. And so the bills stopped coming. The, the, he started teaching me privately, but never, never sent me a bill. He wanted, he wanted me to see me play well. He, he took, it, to me, I don't know whether Jack Grout was the best teacher in the world, but to me, a great teacher is somebody who takes an interest in, his, in the kid, in his pupil. And so Jack encouraged me to play. I played my first tournament that year was a club championship, the sub-juvenile club. I shot 121 <laughs> and won. <laughs> okay. And, you know, <clears throat> So that's how I started. We, we started playing. We played junior stuff around the district. We played club matches. Uh, we would play district medal play and district match play. We'd play a state uh, medal play, two, or two different medal players. We'd have JC, JC juniors in those days as well as the state juniors. 
and, and, and I, played, I played enough golf that, 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 that the Ohio Golf Association had. I qualified for the USJ Juniors when I was 13, so I played five years in a row in that. Uh, I enjoyed, I, that's where I loved, learned, that's where I got my love for the USGA and how they governed the game of golf and the way they set up golf courses. I loved what they did. A great lesson I got was when I was 13 years old, I was the first match off at Southern Hills in Tulsa. And it, I had a 7.30 starting time and I was playing a kid from upper New York called Stanley Ziabrowski. Never forget it. I walked up to the tee about 30 seconds before my starting time. Now Joe Dye at that time was the executive director of the USJ. He was Mr. Golf basically in those days. And he looked at me and says, young man, 30 seconds later, you're on the second tee, one down. He shocked me, because I mean, I'm a 13 year old kid. I didn't know any different. And so I'm never late for starting time <laughs> <laughs> because of that. And uh, uh, the, uh, what was there? I'm trying to figure what the question was. Junior golf. Oh, yeah, junior golf, yeah. So I played the USGA juniors, I played uh, uh, Ohio juniors, I played the district juniors, I played uh, JC juniors, which was a national tournament at that time. You kids look like this. And the, the JC juniors was sweet. They took four from each state. And they went, they, they don't have this tournament anymore, but they should. It's a great tournament. And those four went to, to, the, to the nationals for each day. And they played as a, as a team. And then the individuals went, had an individual championship. And uh, I played that three times. And I finished, uh, I, I lost the playoff when I was 16. And I, got, I won a $1,000 scholarship from that for to use for college. And then I won it when I was 17, and I got another $1,000 scholarship. Now that's $2,000 I got for, for college, for scholarship. How far do you think I'd take you guys today? <laughs> you know what it did for me, it took me? It took me to the second quarter of my senior year. Wow. $2,000. Wow. Tuition, room, and board. <clears throat> Ohio State was a cheap school. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, think that, I think that shows you what education is, how it's changed. But uh, the JC Juniors were, was a great tournament. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, I, got plenty of, I got plenty of golf in. Uh, I, didn't, I, I wish we'd had an AJGA, and, uh, uh, but we didn't. And so we played, we played at whatever events there were and everything else. We didn't have any rankings. We didn't have anything. Uh, as, as far as comparison, except what you did in national tournaments. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Um, Mr. Nicholas, I've heard a lot about your Play Yellow campaign with the PGA Tour. Um, I was wondering what's personal and special about this goal and how can we help? Well, Play Yellow, uh, Let's go back to where, where play yellow come, where yellow comes from. And uh, back in 19, about 68, there was a young man named uh, uh, Craig, and uh, I'm blank, Mary Lou and Bill Smith, right? And they were our ministers at, at the church that Barbara went to. And uh, they, uh, they had a boy that thir it was 13 years old, or no, he, he wasn't 13 then. He was about 10, that was, had contracted Ewing sarcoma. And Mary Lou knew Barbara. She called Barbara and she asked if Jack would talk to him. So I called him and went over to talk with Greg, Craig. And uh, we sort of developed a relationship. And so I'd call him every week when I played or, or every other week or whatever it might be. We talked quite a bit. And finally, one of the tournaments was going along. He said, I knew you were going to win this week. I wore my yucky, lucky yellow shirt. Okay, so I started wearing yellow shirts on Sunday. And I won quite a few tournaments with yellow shirts on Sunday. And, uh, but, I had, but Craig passed away in 1971. He was 13 years old. And... 
we were at the 86 Masters. And this is you know, 15 years after he passed. And I was getting up in the morning, I was sort of looking around clothes, and I saw this yellow shirt in my suitcase. And I said, I pulled it out, I said, Barbara, what do you think? He says, she says, Craig, Craig would love it. So why don't you put it on? So I, wore the, I put on the yellow shirt for Sunday at the Masters in 86. And of course I won. And of course, Mary Lou and Bill, their parents, they recognized what was going on immediately. And I had never told anybody about it. And so a few years later, we started thinking about charities. And we started a yellow shirt campaign at the Memorial Tournament. And just a small campaign, but we raised a little bit of money for charity. And finally, a year or so, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, the Children's Miracle Network came to us and said they would like to, to raise um, about $100 million in a program for golf, through golf. And I think, I think it was 279 Children's Miracle Network hospitals, Barb? About right, isn't it? 179? Yeah, okay. Give or take 100. <laughs> anyway, 179 <clears throat> Children's Miracle Network hospitals. And so we started, I went to the tour, and the tour loved the idea of doing this and raising the money through golf. It was, every, every town you go into, you know, we, we do charity, so we have, uh, they'll have a children's hospital that never leaves that town for the children's hospital in that particular town. And most of them are, are Children's Miracle Network hospitals. And so uh, uh, we started the program this year and, and decided to use the yellow, so we called Play Yellow Campaign. And so uh, a, lot of, a lot of the players have worn yellow for it. Uh, I know that Taylor Bay came out with yellow bags for the guys the first week they introduced it. And uh, they had yellow shoes and all kinds of, 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 of stuff. But it was all for kids and, and raising money for that. Well, Jack, I want to thank uh, you and Barbara for your, your time here today. Very special opportunity to hear your stories, hear your impact on the game, what you and Barbara have done as a family uh, for golf, and uh, what an inspiration for these uh, young men and women heading into an important event for them uh, well, this thank week. You, thank you, Steve. I think you're gonna find, I think you're gonna find as you, as you go play and you get to know your fellow competitors that, uh, you know, that the, 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 the feeling you'll have towards them uh, will get stronger as time goes on. You'll, you'll have bonds that you'll make here and elsewhere that will last a lifetime. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to, uh, uh, go home and tell tell your friends what great great young men and women you met, and uh, uh, how how they're contributing to society and how they're contributing to to, to making America a better place, and well in the world because you got kids from all over the world here today, don't you? Yep. And so, uh, and golf is and golf is the the bonding part of that. Mm -hmm. Golf is the agent that brings brings you all together. It's a wonderful game. It's uh, I've been very blessed to have been able to play it uh, and play it at a high level. Uh, and now, you know, as I say, people have always said they want to play golf like I do. Mm. Now most people can. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you understand what that means, it means I don't play very well anymore. <laughs> but I still love the game. I still love to play it. I love what it, what it did for me and for my family and what it does for other people. So good luck to you all. You all play well. Uh, I'll see another 65 out there tomorrow, or another 71. Is that where we had on the, on the girl? The girls had 71 was a low score. Mm -hmm. So, uh, good luck to you all, and thank you for having us here today. We enjoyed being part of part of your tournament.